Good evening. I'm David Ferriero, the Archivist of the United States, and it's a pleasure to welcome you to the William G. McGowan Theater this evening for this evening's program celebrating First Lady Pat Nixon, and a special welcome to our C-SPAN audience. Before we begin, I'd like to tell you about two programs coming up later this month. On Wednesday, April 18th, we'll have a special discussion on slavery freedom to observe the 150th anniversary of the DC emancipation. The next week, on Monday, April 23rd, we'll host a Nixon legacy forum called Waging Peace, Nixon and Geopolitics in the Middle East. To learn more about these and all of our programs and exhibits, consult our monthly calendar of events and there are sign-up sheets in the lobby where you can receive it by regular mail or email. You'll also find brochures about other National Archives exhibits and programs. Another way to get more involved in the National Archives is to become a member of the Foundation for the National Archives. The Foundation supports the work of, our, of the agency, especially our outreach programs and their applications and membership. And another way to support the National Archives is to visit our archive shop. We can do that physically or virtually. And our number one item, sales item, is this photograph of President Nixon and Elvis Presley. Where is it? It's gone. Sorry. There it is. This is truly our number one item, which is really very nice. We are very pleased to be partnering with the Richard Nixon Foundation and presenting this panel discussion. And we're honored to host our panelists, Colonel John V. Brennan, the Nixon's Marine Corps aide, William R. Cotis, the State Department's Assistant Chief of Protocol for visits during the Nixon years, Lieutenant General Don Hughes, Military Assistant to President Nixon, Bob Bostock, the curator of the Pat Nixon Centennial Exhibit at the Nixon Library. And I encourage all of you, if you haven't been to Yorba Linda recently, please visit. This exhibit is extraordinary. And a very special welcome to an expert on Pat Nixon, Julie Nixon Eisenhower. <laughs> Julie serves on the, as a member of the board of the Richard Nixon Foundation. Pat Nixon was admired and liked by a broad spectrum of people at home and abroad, regardless of their political leanings. She had a talent for connecting with people and putting them at ease. Tonight, we look forward to learning more about her international travels and valued role as a goodwill ambassador. No other first lady had traveled so much until Pat Nixon set out into the world. She traveled to over, uh, uh, over 75 countries, most famously China and Russia with the president, but also on her own to Lib Liberia, Ghana, the Ivory Coast, Venezuela, Southeast Asia, and more. In 1970, her immediate and heartfelt trip to Peru after a devastating earthquake earned her the gratitude of the people and the government. Whether greeting heads of state, introducing herself to children, or bringing comfort in a crisis, Pat Nixon was always a caring and gracious lady. Now I'll turn you over to Sandy Quinn, the vice president of the Nixon Foundation. He was an assistant to Richard Nixon, traveling with him during his 1962 California gubernatorial bid, and later served on the staff of Governor Ronald Reagan and U.S. Senator George Murphy. He was head of marketing for Walt Disney World in Florida through construction and its opening and several years of operation, and later joined the Marriott Corporation as a division vice president. He was president of Quinn and Bryan Marketing and Communications and for many years served blue, chir blue chip corporate accounts throughout the United States. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Sandy Quinn. I can't miss this opportunity uh, to raise some money for the Richard Nixon Foundation, which was privately supported, because David was so kind to present that photograph of President Nixon and, uh, and Elvis Presley when they visited, uh, when Elvis Presley visited the president at the White House. Now, I know all of you are Elvis fans, you're Nixon fans, so you can get keychains and magnets and mugs. <laughs> 
T-shirts and, and that photograph too. And that photograph and several colorful executions on T-shirts. And you can do that on www.nixonfoundation.org. Great gifts. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, and thank you, David Ferriero, for, um, for embracing so much of our programming. Uh, we've had several Nixon Legacy Forums right here on this stage. Nixon Legacy Forums tell the story of what happened in the White House in all of the arenas of innovation and vision that he, that, uh, that, that he insisted on in, uh, in energy and in health care and law enforcement, uh, Supreme Court justices and diplomacy. We have seven more planned this year. Some of them we hope will be on this stage. And if you check our website, you'll know when and where they are. We are in Pat Nixon's 100th birthday year, her centennial. And because of that, on March 16th, we opened the, a spectacular Pat Nixon uh, exhibit, a centennial exhibit, themed to people were her project, because indeed they were. Uh, that exhibit will be up all summer long and into the fall. Then next year is Richard Nixon's centennial, and we'll do the same for the 37th president. Now, uh, tonight, however, we're focusing on a particular aspect of Pat Nixon's extraordinary contributions as First Lady, and that was as Ambassador Goodwill. And uh, our panel will address that. But first, I'd like to show you a brief video, a short video, with some comments from uh, well-known Americans that we're very proud of. Uh, let us view the video, please. I rise today to celebrate the centennial of the birth of First Lady Patricia Nixon. With her husband's election as Vice President on Dwight Eisenhower's ticket in 1952, Mrs. Nixon became the second lady of the land. The Nixons traveled extensively, including for more than two months in Asia and the Pacific in 1953, and to South America in 1958, where the couple demonstrated tremendous courage in Caracas while being attacked by a communist mob and to the Soviet Union in 1959. During the presidential years, the First Lady was truly our ambassador of goodwill. Visiting South Vietnam, an active combat zone in 1969, an earthquake ravaged Peru in 1970, and China in the groundbreaking trip of 1972. Mrs. Nixon was responsible for the gift from the Chinese of the two giant pandas to the American people. Mrs. Nixon's grave marker reads, even when people can't speak your language, they can tell if you have love in your heart. Patricia Ryan Nixon had love in her heart, and now at her 100th birthday, we remember her for her devotion to family, her grace and perseverance, and her patriotism to the United States of America. Greetings to those gathered for the celebration of the 100th birthday of First Lady Pat Nixon. Americans know her as a model of graciousness in the spotlight and grace under pressure. Pat Nixon was a remarkable woman who earned the respect and affection of all those who knew her, either personally or from afar. She's even more greatly admired by all the First Ladies who succeeded her in what she once called the hardest unpaid job in the world. I loved Pat Nixon. She was a sensational, gracious, and thoughtful First Lady. She served our nation with great dignity and warmth. She was one of the most loyal and courageous women I have ever known. So on the centennial of Pat Nixon's birthday, I am so pleased to be able to remember her as a great First Lady and an even greater friend to my family and me. I also recall how gracious, warm, and friendly she was. When Jimmy decided to run for president, the Nixons were still in the White House. I naturally became more curious about Pat's duties as First Lady. She was traveling extensively as a goodwill ambassador around the world. Actually, she visited more foreign countries than any other First Lady before her. I especially admired Pat's poise in the face of tremendous challenges. She was always gracious and courteous in every situation. First of all, she was uh, recognized over 20 times as one of the most admired women in, in the world. 
when you would move with the president through a, a crowd uh, in any form or fashion. Uh, one, she was beautiful. And secondly, uh, that, that great smile and her graciousness uh, just really stood out with uh, anybody that ever met her. So it was easy to, to, to advance her. And I was President Nixon's chief advance man and spent an awful lot of time with both he and Mrs. Nixon traveling both domestically and internationally. She was a, a, a star. I mean, she, in, in, her, in her own right, when she was not with the president, uh, gracious in every aspect, uh, charming, engaging. Uh, I mean, she really, the people were her business. I mean, she... President Bush and I send our best wishes to each of you for a wonderful celebration. We know we're joined by millions of Americans in honoring Pat Nixon today and always for her life and her service to the land we all love. I'd like to introduce the panel, starting with its moderator, Bob Bostock, who was the curator of the Pat Nixon exhibit and worked very closely with uh, President Nixon in his New Jersey office because he was one of the principal authors and architects of the exhibitry, which you'll see at the Richard Nixon Presidential Library in Yorba Linda. Uh, Bob worked closely with him, and we're delighted to have him here as moderator. Bob. <laughs> Bill Cotus. Bill was uh, Assistant Chief of Protocol in the State Department, and he was assigned to Mrs. Nixon, traveled with her on so much of her travels. Uh, later, he was director of the Office of International Visitors for the United States Information Agency, Bill Cotus. <laughs> Jack Brennan. Jack Brennan, Colonel Brennan, was the Nixon, I mean, was the uh, Marine aide to President Nixon from 1969 through 74. Later, when the president went to San Clemente after the presidency, he was his chief of staff. He accompanied uh, President and Mrs. Nixon to China twice, including the original trip. Uh, General Don Hughes, he was the military assistant to uh, President Nixon. He was also his military assistant as vice president. He was commander in chief of the Pacific Fleet, knew the Nixons very, very well, and we're proud and delighted to have him here. And of course, <laughs> and of course, Julie, who's author of the uh, biography of her mother uh, entitled Pat Nixon, The Untold Story, and also worked with uh, her husband, David Eisenhower, in writing Going Home to Glory, a memoir of, of uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower from the period 1961 to 69. Ladies and gentlemen, your panel. <laughs> I hope we can get that video working before we're done, because it's really good. Because he produced it. <laughs> <laughs> we take it for granted these days that uh, senior government officials travel all around the world, but that hasn't always been true. So I think a great place to start today would be to uh, ask Julie, who although she was only five years old when her parents went on their first international mission as Vice President Mrs. Nixon in 1953, because she's an authority on, uh, on her mother and uh, her, her biography of her mother, Pat Nixon, The Untold Story, 10 weeks on the New York Times bestseller, the definitive biography of Pat Nixon. Where might we um, buy that? <laughs> it's available as an e-book now, so be sure to go on to uh, find it for your Kindle or Nook or any other reading device. But uh, Julie, if you would uh, start by talking a little bit about the context in which that first trip that President Eisenhower asked your parents to make 45,000 miles, 10 weeks, 17 countries. Right. Well, it was 1953, and Eisenhower, when he was elected, it, I would say it was probably the height of the Cold War. Um, the war was still raging in Korea. The French were fighting in Vietnam. Uh, the, there were a lot of countries all over the world that were new, had declared themselves neutral. They had been colonies for a long time, and now they were neutral, and the Soviet Union and the United States were vying to become their friends and their protectors and their advisors. And my mother wrote a letter to her dear friend, Helene Drown, um, 
that summer of 1953, and she said, um, they had talked at Whittier together, and she said, Dear Helene, I guess we're not going to be able to see you this summer because uh, the president said to Dick after a meeting, um, what are you doing this summer? And Dick said, well, nothing, Mr. President. And, and the president said, well, I want you to go to Asia, and I want you to take Pat. And that was the genesis of what the, was the first of what became the Goodwill Trips um, all over the world, all four continents, 53 countries. And the reason that that first trip was such a success uh, was articulated by the Secret Service agent who was with my parents. Um, his name was um, Jack Sherwood. And there were only two Secret Service agents on that detail, by the way, who traveled with my parents. They had a staff of five people. My mother had no assistant. They were gone 70 days. They were in 17 countries, including Vietnam, Korea, Iran, Pakistan, Afghanistan, 12 other countries. But anyway, Jack Sherwood wrote in his diary, you know, the Nixons are really shaking things up because they're not doing what is expected diplomatically of you know, these usual trips. They're, they're stopping their motorcade, they're getting out, they're shaking hands with people, rich and poor, they're meeting with labor leaders, they're meeting with quote unquote agitators, they're meeting with communists, they're mingling, they're mixing, and it was that people to people uh, contact of the goodwill trips that made them so effective, and that's why Eisenhower sent them to all four continents in the next eight years. So that's the context of how my mother started out as the ambassador um, of goodwill with my father. Um, Don, you, um, Julie mentioned five staff members in the, in the first term they traveled with. You joined uh, the vice president's staff as a military aide early in uh, the second term as vice president. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you could uh, tell us a little bit about how you came to that position and kind of what the role was and uh, what was travel like for the vice presidential party uh, during those years? Well, I'd like to, first of all, always straighten that uh, Pacific Fleet thing out. <laughs> <laughs> I had a fleet, but there were a fleet of airplanes. This is <laughs> Pacific Air Force. Uh, but yeah, I can, I'd like to key off Julie's uh, uh, story about the, the, for that particular trip, because that resulted in my getting over there. Uh, Rose Woods was on that trip, and they used Admiral Radford, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, they used his aircraft, and he sent his uh, senior officer, his senior exec, along, to, and he, he, of course, Rose Woods was on the trip. So when he finished those 70 or 75 days, uh, Rose had worked him over pretty good about how small the, the staff was, and, and he was watching her do all of these things. Uh, and when he got to see when he reported back to the admiral, he said, if anybody ever needed a couple of military aides, it's the vice president. So I started to get some unusual phone calls, and uh, I was a very unhappy captain flying a desk in the Pentagon, and I'd have done anything to get out. And so when I got these phone calls, I wasn't sure what they were going to be the result of them, but I went. And pretty soon I talked to Admiral Radford, and the next thing I know, I had been selected to be the first, uh, one of the first presidential, or vice presidential aides. Colonel Cushman from the Marine Corps was the other. And uh, I have to admit that when we got over there, uh, the, the president, the vice president, and uh, Mrs. Nixon too, I think, really didn't want us around because they weren't used to having the, uh, the military. But anyway, after much persuasion uh, from by Admiral Radford, uh, the vice president agreed to take us for three weeks on a trial basis, and we were going on that trip <laughs> to Africa. Yeah. Uh, well, being the senior, Cushman went with the president, the vice president, and I went on the press plane with Rose, and I would then be my, be an aide to the uh, uh, to Pat when we got on, uh, on in in Africa. Well, I didn't know anything about it. And uh, so when we first struggled along a few things, it was, I wasn't sure whether, nobody knew who was the aide and who was the AD. But, <laughs> but, but she was a teacher. And she quickly picked up on the fact that she had a lot to teach. And uh, <laughs> at first, it was very formal. But then we gradually got to know each other. 
and uh, we, we, we got along fine. Uh, then when we came back from that trip, the day of, de the day of decision came, and uh, in our little clevy holes up in the, the old Senate office building, and Cushman went in to see the vice president about our fate, and he came out and he said, uh, well, I'm gonna be the national security advisor, and he said, uh, you can go back to the Air Force. So I grabbed my phone and I started to deal, dial to the Air Force to say that the vice president wanted me to go to George Air Force Base to fly F-100s. <laughs> <laughs> and about that time, Rose got up and stormed into the office, and she came out about three or four minutes later brushing the, that red hair back, and she said, Put the phone down, Sonny. She said, you're, she said, Dottie Cox is pregnant. You're the new appointment secretary. <laughs> so that's, and, and, and a military aide. So that's how I got there. That's now, Don, on, on those uh, trips during those years, what, 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 what were the conditions you were working under on travel? What kind of aircraft were you on? And, well, and that's well, sort of, in, what were the in, challenges in those days, you faced? In those days, the vice president did not have any of, of those the trappings or whatever you want to call them. Uh, we were strictly a, a ad hoc up there. If we, if, if we had a, 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 a political uh, or, or something that was non-governmental, we would rent an, uh, an airplane. But if it was official business, we would, uh, the, the, the White House would give us a, an airplane to go do it. Uh, and interestingly enough, we got stuck one night coming back uh, and we were all stacked up in going into Washington. And with, this was with a government airplane. So it was quite annoying. And the next day, I got uh, Colonel Draper heard about it. He was the White House aide. He said, from now on, when you're flying in a military airplane, you're Air Force Two. So that's how Air Force Two came about. But the airplanes themselves in those days, when we first started, they were strictly prop airplanes. Mm. Uh, the jets were coming into being, but we, we didn't have them. In fact, we didn't have them until we took the trip to, to Russia. Now, Jack, you were military aide during the White House years. Were, uh, were conditions quite as primitive as they were during the huh. vice presidential years? Well, once uh, my boss was General Hughes, by the way, <laughs> in the White House. <laughs> and after a couple of years of everything posh, you know, we had 707s and helicopters and uh, I think we kind of got spoiled, and he was recognizing it. I mean, we got to the point where advanced men were saying, uh, when we take a 707, we don't particularly want one of those that doesn't have windows in it, you know, it's kind of, <laughs> and he was getting a little tired of this. He, and I think he said, we'll teach you a lesson. He didn't say it out loud. But poor Bill Cotis and I and a team went to advance to make the arrangements for Mrs. Nixon to go to, to go to, uh, on the Africa trip, three countries in Africa. We didn't get a 707 with windows. We didn't get a 707 without windows. We got the Columbine. <laughs> he gave us a four-engine plane. That we had to stop in Bermuda. We had to stop in the Azores. We finally got to Africa. Now I had. But it I, was President Eisenhower's plane. You know, really, that's right. It was the Columbine. That, right. It was very prestigious. Right. Jack, junk. Jack, remember, Jack, we, re we dropped an engine. Dropped an engine and <laughs> had to stop in Bermuda. And I had gotten, I had just gotten my yellow fever shot, and I was sick as a dog all the way. When we got to Africa, I didn't want to leave Africa. I'm not going back on that plane. I was going to stay, but they wouldn't accept me. Uh, but overall, thing, because of General Hughes, really, things were hugely improved, of course, in the White House. And the significant thing was, on our very first, well, during the transition, General Hughes wrote a note for the president to sign, maybe it's called an executive order, saying that the White House Communications Agency came under his cognizance. So everything military, which by the way, there are more than 2,000 people directly uh, reporting to and supporting the president. Uh, and, and they all came under General Hughes in the military office. But the, when we put the White House Communications Agency there, it made a huge difference. Uh, first because of coordination, and then of course getting money from the Defense Department. You could say, we need this, we need this. Mm -hmm. And it was remarkable uh, how, how much we got things improved. So much so, a very quick story, in, uh, in the Soviet Union, we're riding on the Soviet planes and it broke down, and I had insisted that we have a backup plane, once again Soviet, uh, Soviet built, and that communications be put on it, because presidents uh, uh, is required to be in communications with the Congress at all times. Well, the plane broke down, we moved to the backup plane, took off, and Helen Thomas, who I'll talk about a little later, was a UPI reporter, and she came to me chewing gum. She says, 
Okay, Brennan, we got you now. Which is, you don't have communications. You don't. You can't have communications on this plane. So I, <laughs> I get the White House communication guy. I said, call Camp David. Call. I said, here, Helen. Bingo. <laughs> Man, and Nancy Ziegler was there, wasn't it? Nancy was there with uh, Bob Haldeman's wife. You uh, <laughs> remember that? Well, Jack, you know, it, talking about all this WACA, right, White House communications in 2000 and all, it just seems alien to even hear it because my mother, you know, I mean, why wasn't she sick from the, for the, the flu shot or whatever, the yellow fever? <laughs> in other words, she was a one-man band. When, she, when they went to China, she took one aide with her. I mean, that's the way she always traveled. And I think, Don, you reflected that. That's, they didn't even want you and Radford to be hired on, right? Because I think that what they realize that when you're a diplomat, you're most effective if you don't have a big entourage. You've got to get out and meet people. And of course, the presidency today, it's changed. And I understand that there has to be a lot of security. But it's most effective when um, you, know, you go to the markets and you meet the people. and and just don't have the, the shielding. And Don, you were in uh, Africa with Mrs. Nixon in 1957, and, and she visited some markets and uh, had trouble with the limousine. And tell us like, a little bit about that I'd like experience. to say that, that, that Africa was a lot tougher in those days, Jack. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was in high school, General. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, uh, that first, the, 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 that was a trip that we went to, to uh, commemorate the uh, uh, Ghana becoming a nation instead of a, a colony of Great Britain. Mm -hmm. And we went through a great deal of ceremony there, but we f well, then we went on up to Liberia, which uh, I don't care to return to. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the amazing thing about it was, was that uh, the, that place is just terrible. And uh, the, uh, the heat, and, and uh, all that goes with it, the humidity. But strangely enough, Pat n never, sh never showed it. And uh, I was by now, by the time we got there, I was fairly well acquainted with her. And we made many, well, we made a lot of uh, side, side trips because uh, the vice president was going one way and we were going the other. He was going to some of the diplomatic uh, paths, but we went down to uh, the schools, to the hospitals, and the people just loved her because she didn't go through as a, as a per perfunctory uh, visit and look around and say, that's nice. She was talking to the people in the beds, she was talking to the kids, and she loved the children, and they responded to her. Uh, the one uh, thing that was a little tough was uh, when we went down to the market, the market with the farmer's market was about, I'd say, maybe a half mile of wharf that extended out to the ocean. And uh, it was, had a, it was uh, covered, but it was uh, open on the sides. And it was brim. You could smell it a mile away. And uh, uh, it, was their, it was their market day. And they had all of the vegetables and the fish and the meat in that 110 degree heat. And uh, she went down the whole length of it. And uh, we meeting the people, and they were they were handing her little little presents, maybe an orange or something. I was loaded by the time we got <laughs> halfway through, but uh, she stepped across dead rats and she avoided the the, uh, the debris on the on, on the dock and just did it beautifully, so that uh, Don, I was. You know, I was just going to say you might have not liked Liberia, but she loved it because that's where she went back. In 71, yeah, 72, right. and <laughs> represented the United States for the inauguration of Tolbert, yeah. uh, whose grandfather was a slave. Yeah. Just yeah. an historic thing. And that's the great picture where she's wearing the turban. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that, that there's a famous picture of her, which they, it will come we'll up later, yep. where that's she's wearing time. the turban. But, uh, but you're so right. During the vice presidential years, it was really um, primitive conditions of Very travel fun. and all. And yeah. I know my mother told me that on that trip in uh, 53, the 17 countries, they had air conditioning one night. Mm -hmm. And what it was in Saigon, and the American ambassador gave up his bedroom. But that was the only mm -hmm. time they had air conditioning that whole trip. Air conditioning, yeah. yeah. Bill. Can I carry on that on, with Liberia? We advanced Liberia and with a 10 men and one lady. 
And the lady is here, uh, Mary Lou Shields, who worked with us in, in And she was in Liber on, on the trip? On, on the okay. advance. Great. Mary Lou? She was to in charge. Stand up. Mary Lou. <laughs> she was in charge. Okay. Right. Don't you want to tell that story, that quick story, Mary Lou? No, I got the tape. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, we, on the, as Jack had mentioned, we went on the, uh, the uh, Eisenhower's plane, and we had 10 men and one woman, and the one woman was Mary Lou, which is quite interesting, and we did drop an engine there. But getting into Liberia, uh, President Tolbert, it was the inauguration, and of course he invited President Nixon, of course, President mm -hmm. Nixon couldn't go, so he sent his best product, it was Mrs. Mrs. Nixon. Yeah. Bill, if I could, I, before we get to that oh. story, I, I oh. want to just stay on the one more thing on the vice presidential years, and then we, because okay. we've got some great pictures that are going to go with that, and I don't want to spoil it. Oh, all right. But I, I want to <laughs> just ask Don briefly to uh, talk with us about the, the trip to uh, South America, and specifically in Caracas, uh, where, the, where the Nixon motorcade was attacked. Well, that, uh, that's, the, that, that's the centerpiece of, I think, the whole vice presidential years. Uh, it was a, a, a trip that the vice president did not really want to do. He felt that it wasn't needed and so forth, but uh, the State Department and uh, uh, the uh, President Eisenhower asked him to do it, so he did. And uh, we, uh, again, got the airplane from the from the chief of uh, the, uh, the the joint chiefs and we started down to do the uh, to visit the Frondizi inauguration in uh, Argentine which was the first free election since uh, Perón the Perón group that was the purpose of the trip but of course the president and Pat were thinking of other things that they could do in these other countries which we did uh, the, the, the initial trips, uh, Argentina, Paraguay, uh, uh, Uruguay, Paraguay, were very benign. And uh, Bolivia wasn't bad, except you couldn't breathe with 13,000 feet. <laughs> and then we went down to Peru, where we had been warned that we might be picking up some communist reaction, uh, some uh, heckling and things of that nature, but nothing, nothing real serious. Uh, until we got to Peru and the issue was whether he would go to the San Marcos University, I guess it was the oldest in the hem Western Hemisphere, and uh, against a lot of advice he went and there was a, a confrontation with thousands of uh, uh, all ginned up troops, I mean the people who were against us and it, uh, it, it finally developed into some rocks that were thrown and a couple of the people were injured in our party. Uh, and after we got away from that, the next two trips and the, the next two visits in Ecuador and Colombia were fine. But on the way, we picked up some, informa some, some scattered information about something in Venezuela. They mentioned an assassination plot on the vice president, and, but it, none of it had any real uh, substance. So, we weren't worried about it. And uh, on the way into Caracas, I called Betty, my wife, on the radio phone, and uh, she said, boy, you want to watch out when you get there. I said, well, yeah, what about? She said, you're going to have trouble. So anyway, she was right. Uh, we landed, and uh, this, the, the crowd was just screaming, and you, so we weren't sure whether what they were saying or anything, and the, our uh, translator said, uh, Mr. Vice President, they're not friendly. And they had the, they had the uh, greeting party set up like you, you'd never do it if you knew what was going to happen. Because we had to walk across the, from the airplane to the uh, uh, terminal building and through it out to the cars. Well, there was balconies on both sides and it was lined with people who just were delighted to spit all over us. And uh, to make it worse, as we were filing along there to go through, the band started to play the Venezuela National Anthem. So we stopped right under the canopy, which got us all properly spit upon from above and people screaming at us. 
So we got in the, on the other side, and we got, the, got it going out the other side to the cars. And by this time, the, there was a large crowd outside, and they were screaming and hollering, Fuera Nixon, and so forth. And, uh, it got, they, so they, we called off the rest of the greeting ceremony, and uh, we got in the, in the automobiles. Originally, they had convertibles, and thank God they switched them to uh, regular sedans. So uh, the, vice, the, uh, the vice president was in front with the foreign minister in his car, and uh, Pat and I were in the back with the farmer, foreign minister's wife. And uh, by this time, she was starting to be a little bit upset. The so foreign I, minister's wife was getting upset? Hmm? The foreign minister's wife was getting upset? Oh, yeah, she was, yeah, well, she was a little bit upset at that time. But we, we tried to get in, the, we opened the door and got her in the car, and Pat took her handkerchief and wiped the seat off so that she could uh, uh, get rid of some of the spittle. And we, off we started. We had a, originally we had some police and army around, around us. And as we progressed into town, they, uh, they evaporated. They just left. And instead of it, there we were in the middle of these people who were, I mean thousands of them, who were screaming at us, throwing rocks and bricks and anything they could throw. And then we finally got to a, a roadblock, so we were stopped. It was a, a, sort of an ambush, if you will, because they all converged on us. And uh, uh, I don't mind saying it, it's the scariest thing I think I've ever been in, because uh, they, they were throwing the rocks, the, the windows were being shattered, and uh, we could see the, the president's car, the vice president's car, getting the same treatment up ahead, and pretty soon they began to rock our car, which is really bad. And about that time, we had about 12 Secret Service agents for the whole thing by now. And those guys really earned their pay. They were real heroes in my estimation. And how was Mrs. Nixon reacting in the car when Well, this was she was going just going to tell you, she was, we, when this chaos was going on, and you, you, you've never, I've never had anything like it, because my exper experience with war was, I didn't see the people I was shooting at, or they were shooting at me, but here, they were right there, and the hate on their faces was just unbelievable. They were, they were out to kill us. And uh, the, uh, it, all of that going on, and Mrs. Nixon finally had this, the uh, minister's wife, who was by now hysterical. So Pat had her arm around her, and she and I were talking kind of quietly, and she kept asking me to be checking on the car up ahead to make sure the vice president was all right, which I was doing. But finally, we managed to, the Secret Service managed to break us out of that roadblock, and we just forgot about the stop that we were going to make. And when we got, we limped all the way up to the uh, residence of the ambassador up on the hill where it was secure. And, uh, it, but all through it, Pat never, ever raised her voice. She never, showed any anxiety. Uh, she was busy with this, this woman. I'll, I'll never forget that. And uh, we got up, up to the uh, embassy and uh, got out and went in and took a deep breath and started to recover. Yeah. Uh, it was clearly the, uh, a thing that I'll never forget. Mm. Ever. Can, can I, I want to add one thing to that. Um, as far as you said you were close to death, the, that there, that photo, I think, is yeah, very yeah. vivid. All the all the windows except one on the car were smashed on my father's car. But what was so interesting was that when I was ri writing the book about yeah. my mother, I said, "Well, were you afraid? You know, there are bats, baseball bats, and rocks." And and I had talked to you, Don, and yeah. and she said, "No, I was angry." She said, yeah. "I was angry because these communist, the, which is what mm -hmm. she said, the co these communist-inspired hoodlums." We're destroying a goodwill trip. And that's just so typical Pat Nixon. I mean, she had her eyes on what they were trying to do, what they, why they were there. They were on a mission. And, and this was going to be the whole story, was that just one small group who were bent on destruction would, just, would ruin the goodwill of, of being in South America. And she said that once she got to the embassy, though, she said then she was afraid because she realized what a close call it was when they got to the American embassy and they went in and, and uh, Rose Woods came in and they, you know, the three of them, mm. they, you know, they 
I think that's when she realized that it had really been a near death experience. Now, Julie, how did how did you and how did you and your sister hear about this attack, or did you hear we, about it? We we just heard about it. I we didn't we the San Marcos that incident that Don described so well. We were watching television at home, and we heard that um, my parents were being attacked by mobs, in, and it's at, at San, San Marcos. But that was a, not a true story. It wasn't that bad, mm -hmm. and we ran to the phone and called my father's office. But as far as Caracas, we really didn't hear about it at the time. Yeah. Later, I think somebody from my dad's office came out and, and said everything's all right. And so it really wasn't until I was researching the book that I realized how serious it was because my parents you know, didn't come back from trips and talk about that kind of thing or the negative. It was about what they were trying to do. And that was the focus. So we, we were really clueless that mm -hmm. it would have been so dangerous. But your mother really had her hands full with that hysterical woman. Yes. I, mean, I, I mean, that was something <laughs> yes. else. Yes. And uh, then the next day, we uh, then the, the, the hunter, the four military people who were running the country, came up to visit the, uh, the vice president. And uh, just quickly, I'll finish this. Uh, we were up in the uh, pre vice president's quarters, and uh, the, the steward announced that the hunter was there. The hunter was the four people, the four people that led the country. So pre the vice president said, fine, I'll be down. So he went in his room with your mother, and uh, then I, I, he was t we were talking to him through an open door, and he was taking his tie off and his shirt. And I said, what, sir, what are you doing? He said, I'm going to bed, take a nap. <laughs> and your, your mother smiled, and uh, so I said, okay, I got out. And he, he did, he got in bed, but I don't think he slept, but he wished to wait 45 minutes and then he went downstairs and just took these junta apart, piece by each. Oh, right, it was magnificent. <laughs> but, uh, but then the next day when we left, I was helping your mother in the car, and I opened the door, and there was a submachine gun and three hand grenades. <laughs> so Pat very delicately reached over and picked up one of the grenades, but finger and her thumb, and she said, I think this belongs to you. <laughs> <laughs> so then we went on down, and we, uh, as, I, as I said in your mother's uh, eulogy, we went out in Nixon style with all flags flying. Mm -hmm. And that pretty well wraps Caracas up, I yeah. think. Julie, your mother visited 53 countries during the vice presidential years, um, which is just extraordinary. Propeller of aircraft, no air conditioning, et cetera. Um, what, what do you think? What ground did she break as a result of her travels during those years? And, and really, what precedence has she set that other senior uh, government folks have followed in all the years since? Well, I think she, she did really break ground in that she said to the embassies, I don't want any teas. I want to go to the schools, the hospitals, and the institutions. And that's what she did. And, and by the end of that first trip, she'd been in 200 hospital schools and, and meeting with women. And when she got back to the United States, the women who covered the White House and the, and the First Lady, uh, they wanted an interview. So I was reading transcripts of those interviews um, later when I was doing the research on the book. And I was just fascinated what my mother said. She told these women, in 1953, Women of the Press, she said, everywhere I went on this trip, I helped women. This is 1953, this is not 63 or 73. The woman's movement isn't even much of an idea in 53, but she was very aware that she was able to help women who were not being represented, who were um, living very difficult lives. Mm -hmm. And so that was her, she said, I was able to help women. And that's what she told these reporters about. Yeah, great. I want to fast forward to the, uh, the White House years. Um, and Bill Cotis, who did so much planning for, uh, for those trips, Julie writes in her book, my mother thoroughly enjoyed Bill and always felt at ease when he was involved in planning a trip. She apparently also planned to make sure she had a birthday oh. cake when it was her <laughs> birthday on one of those trips. But you were at the State Department uh, as Assistant uh, Chief of Protocol for Visits. visits. How right. did you get involved in, in starting the planned visits for Mrs. Nixon overseas? Well, the, uh, as a, the visit section that we were in charge of, uh, when the President Nixon invited these dig dignitaries, the Chiefs of State, Heads of Government, uh, Protocol got involved in planning the trips. 
here in the United States. In those days, a visit, a visit from be it Liberia or Saudi Arabia, uh, was a seven-day visit it was, a, it was for a state visit, and an official visit was four days. But then eventually, uh, I can, was involved in that and traveling with these chiefs of state heads of government around the United States and got involved in some people who form, a, I should say, uh, chiefs of state who have brought their wife. There was some uh, friction every once in a while because they were so rather demanding, but not Mrs. Nixon. Mm -hmm. But anyway, we then got to go to Liberia, and this is quite interesting. In Liberia, we went on the advance teams, Jack said. Ten, ten men and one lady, as Mary Lou Shields, came with us. Now, and the decision uh, to go to Liberia was because they had invited President Nixon, but his schedule didn't allow it, so. Ex exactly, and they also, from uh, Liberia, then we went to Ghana, and from Ghana to the Ivory Coast. But in Liberia, it was the inauguration of President Talbert, mm. and it was quite interesting. In fact, one of the Secret Service men who was here, who had been there for years, Patrick McFarland, you remember him? Yes. Uh, uh, <clears throat> he was on our detail. And when we arrived, there was a tremendous ceremony out at the airport. Uh, and then she also got a 19-gun salute, which is very unusual. Your 19-gun salute you give to an official, you get a prime minister or a 21 salute for a, a, a reigning shah as such. Now, in getting ready to go on those trips, before you would go on a trip, um, such as that or, or other trips, how involved was Mrs. Nixon in, in planning what the itinerary was going to be well, and, and uh, making sure you were course, doing what she wanted State to do? Well, the State Department and the White House get together and say, mm -hmm. where she, well, of course, Mrs. Nixon, they invited President Nixon, and he couldn't make it, so he sent his best representative. And the way they, they plan it is what's important, what parts of the world that they have to go. Mm. And from there, we then, after Liberia, we then went to Ghana. And there- I wanna, I'm, I'm, I hate to interrupt you, but we've got pictures on that coming up. Oh. <clears throat> but if, if we could just, um, if you could just talk a little bit about how what her involvement would be in planning these trips and making sure she was doing the sorts of things that she was in, that she felt were important in these various countries. Would you meet with her and discuss the we, we, schedule? Beforehand, in other words, of course, she was very conscious of a large entourage. Mm -hmm. We only had 10 people who came, went over to Liberia and Ghana, although so, some others came in after that. Mm -hmm. But she s insisted that we don't need a large contingency. But we had to have Secret Service, and we had to have the, the doctor, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But she was very conscious on that, not to have a large staff. Uh, it doesn't look good, you know, for, for the public. Sure. I want to um, turn to Jack now for a minute. One of the first trips right. Mrs. Nixon made uh, as First Lady, uh, the President, Mrs. Nixon, went to the Pacific area, and she went to, uh, to Vietnam. Yeah to visit the uh, troops there in the, in the hospitals and, and, uh, and, mm. and build up their morale. And, and, uh, she, and she did that. I did not go into Vietnam with her, but um, th what she did uh, was not do the photo op thing. She went to see the troops in the hospital, the wounded people in the hospital, not for a picture, but the most important thing she did, and I, I say I didn't go with her, but I was slightly wounded in Vietnam in the, in the, uh, the persons who feel it the most, the family at home. But because my wife and kids just got a telegram and they were afraid, frightened to death to open it and read the telegram and, and then they get no follow-up. I mean, it's a, maybe you get a military guy reading a script saying everything's okay, but you don't know how they, they're frightened. Mrs. Nixon went into the hospitals and took the names of all of the young men who were wounded in the hospital. And when she went back to the United States, called their loved ones to say, I saw him. It's not a script I'm reading. I saw him, and he's doing well. It's going to take a while, or whatever. And they felt so much better. Also, remember how these, these kids felt. They're 10,000 miles from home, in a hospital, alone. Don't even know the guy next to him. They're sad, and to some degree angry. And to have the First Lady of the United States come into a combat zone had never happened before, and, and pay particular attention to these usually young man, it was just, just remarkable things she did, I think, mm -hmm. and courageous. 
So, uh, so she flew right into the combat zone. She, on she a did. Chopper? She went in a helicopter. Uh, several helicopters escorting her, of course. Uh, but yep, she did. Amazing. But, but that was that's just who she was. I mean, she's always always felt for for people. In in Liberia, Bill uh, Bill was just talking about. Um, they, this, this new president of Liberia really wanted to show off the blonde lady. Uh, <laughs> in, in the inaugural parade, you know, who sat next to him, not his wife, the blonde lady. <laughs> and and uh, we got into the church. They had a, a Baptist church to celebrate uh, this guy, excuse me, President Tolbert. I don't want to call him this guy, President Tolbert's <laughs> inauguration. And, uh, and this service went on for three hours. And there's a seat for Mrs. Nixon. And I don't know how it happened, but next to it was a seat for me. And I'm in uniform. And by the end of that service, I perspired. We were gabardine uniform then. I perspired completely through my uniform, and she was smiling. <laughs> <laughs> and I was getting angry. You know, all this stuff was going on. And this guy was using Mrs. Nixon. I felt. She thought, well, that's fine. That's don't diplomacy. worry about it. That's diplomacy. I guess. That's what you're supposed to be doing. And Marines are not be. that diplomatic, I guess. <laughs> Maybe you, they're not. <laughs> later, no. later, he was supposed to pick her up. I said, okay, we'll just go to the inaugural ball. Bill had arranged it. We'll just meet the president at the inaugural ball. No, no, no. The president insists on escorting Mrs. Nixon once again to be but with that, that's what it takes to be a great diplomat is to go with the flow on that. Yeah. Let, let me tell you yeah. what Three I did. Three-hour speech, diplomat. whatever. <laughs> <laughs> he showed it. It was 8 o'clock at night. He's going to pick it up. Nothing. And he has three aides, all generals. I'm a major. And I'm saying, where the hell is he? Where is he? 8.15, <laughs> 8.30. Oh. No, no President Tolbert, and I'm really getting angry. So finally, he, at, at 9 o'clock, we hear all the sirens and the noise coming. I went up to Mrs. Nixon. She said, he's here? I said, yes, he's here. She said, okay, let's go. I said, we're not going. She said, what do you mean we're not going? I said, I'm going to tell him you tore your dress. Let him wait for a while. <laughs> <laughs> she said, no, 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 you're not. You know? It's one of the few times she got her, her, uh, her Irish. Irish German temper up. She said, no, we're not. You know? <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> But uh, anyway, the compassion she showed is just, just mm -hmm. remarkable everywhere we went. So, and I don't want to mix up your pictures here. But, uh, now, the next, the next year, um, there was a devastating earthquake in Peru. And I don't know if all the videos are affected. Do we have the Connie Stewart video? Connie, does it work or not? We'll try it. Connie Stewart, who was Mrs. Nixon's staff director and press secretary, uh, talking about this trip to Peru. Well, that was an amazing trip. Um, uh, we took a plane known as Air Force One if the president was on it, but if the first lady was on it, it was still Air Force One. And then there was another cargo plane that took a lot of stuff, blankets and food and medical supplies and things like that. And the interesting thing to me on that trip was the wife of the president of Peru. Now, she was a beautiful woman, uh, Latin, dark hair, f fair skinned, really a very pretty woman who was well versed in how to behave like a first lady Latin American style. And here comes this blonde, energetic, slender, later says, I want to see some of these people who have really had it. Oh, well, well, we can't really go there. That's not quite what, oh, that's where we're going. And Mrs. Velasco went along with her and watched for about 20 to 30 minutes as Mrs. Nixon would hug some of the uh, Indian uh, people in the high mountains where they went, or cuddle some of the children, or inquire about how were they were doing and what did they need. And she'd turn to one of the military aides who might have been with her at the time and said, make sure these people get such and such. It's on the big plane. It's not on the plane that, that we're on. And it took Mrs. Velasco about 30 minutes. And then she got it. Then she started going around and touching and hugging and feeling. And the two of them together, the brunette and the blonde, it was a fascinating experience in watching this one first lady learn the other first lady techniques. But uh, in Peru, they had suffered a devastating earthquake. Tens of thousands of uh, people killed, many more tens of thousands left homeless. Uh, the need was great. And Mrs. Nixon went to Peru. Julie, could you tell us a little bit about what uh, why she how went there and happened. how that happened, the, yes. Um, the, the, the earthquake was in the high in the Andes, and so it took three weeks for the full magnitude of the disaster to be made known. And it, um, 80,000 people died, half of 400,000 homeless. And my parents were at Camp David because it was their anniversary. And my mother was reading the reports of this, just how terrible, and she said, 
oh, I'm, I'm just, what can I do? I feel like it, I want to do something. And so my father said to her, well, would you like to go? And, and immediately he picked up the phone. He probably was calling some of your colleagues in the State Department and said, you know, would a well visit by Mrs. Nixon be welcome? Because the government of, um, of Peru was a revolutionary government and they, had, they were very anti-American. Mm. And within one week, Americans had donated two plane loads of, of supplies and Air Force One, my mother flew on Air Force One with one plane load, another plane followed and they, um, she went up into the Andes Mountains and landed a, you know, in a cargo plane up there and walked among the rubble and it was just a, a, you know, a great way for the American people to reach out to the Peruvians who had suffered so much and to show that um, it didn't matter what kind of government Peru had, it was what Americans do best. They, they, when there's some kind of tragedy, Americans always respond with goods and, and volunteer and everything. And the Peruvian government recognized your mother with the yes, decoration. Yes, gave her the grand order of the sun, I think. The sun, yeah. thank you. That's right. the highest, highest, uh, yes. highest yes. civilian award that the government yes. offers. And Julie's very generous to say she flew on a cargo plane. Yeah, no. She flew on, <laughs> listen to this, yeah. a C-130, which is a, a cargo, American of course, cargo plane that can, can land on very short airstrips. Yeah. And at the top of a mountain they had created a dirt airstrip, a very short airstrip. The Air Force pilots tied a kitchen chair between the pilot and co-pilot yeah. and strapped her in to that. And I'm saying, <laughs> I'm saying, I'm wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> and they landed on this yeah. very short dirt airstrip, and, and I, I was frightened. She was smiling. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and then we boarded helicopters, which, uh, by the you know, we'd spent a lot of money to send helicopters down there, and the pilot told me we could only take a few people because we're so high. Oh, and the right. so. It was uh, a matter of concern, so uh, those people who couldn't go on the helicopter were not happy, but uh, we, had, we had General Walters who brought, who was our interpreter, and I went, and the doctor went. In any event, then we went fr um, from this mountaintop airstrip, dirt airstrip, in the helicopters to the incredible devastation, incredible. Mm -hmm. Looked like the face of the moon, awful. was that the quote? The and Mrs. Nixon would go right into the hugging people, and you know, and they wow, you know, with tears. And uh, Connie would have said in the video, Connie being Mrs. Nixon's chief of staff, Connie Stewart, uh, she said it well when she said, Mrs. Velasquez, the president of uh, Venezuela's wife, was just watching Mrs. Nixon. What is this woman doing, you know, going into the crowd and mingling with real people? And then after a while, Mrs. Velasquez started doing it. She just followed Mrs. Nixon's role as her lead, and, everyone, and people started, you know, warming up to all of them. Uh, it, it, was a, it was an incredible scene, but it was normal for Mrs. Nixon. But very unusual for uh, the heads, wives of heads of state who are just very aloof from the people, so to speak. One of, was, one of the Peruvian leaders said afterwards that that visit by Mrs. Nixon did more for Peruvian-American relations than any single act in the previous hundred years. It was uh, quite, a, quite, a diplomatic, quite a diplomatic success. Uh, Bill, I want to get back to Liberia and uh, and talk a little bit about I don't. that. No. <laughs> Liberia. <laughs> when Mrs. Nixon went to Liberia, it was the first time that um, a first lady had officially represented the president of the United States at a state event um, overseas. Um, and as you mentioned, she got the 19, 19 gun, gun salute. salute 19 right. gun salute. Um, and you, and you talked about all of the, uh, the ceremony. You and Jock, Jack talked about the ceremony so beautifully sitting through all of them. Um, but then there was a, there was a great uh, a dance that was, that, that, a native dance that was shown for her on the, on the roof of the... Uh, right, the, right there. The, the, uh, tell us about that occasion. Well, it, I, it was quite odd because she disappeared. I mean, <laughs> when I say disappeared, you know, we had her up there and then she disappeared and then came out in this beautiful... Afghan and such, and it made Time magazine, if I recall. <laughs> uh, Liberia was quite a place, and uh, as you know, Jack, um, we, uh, President Tobik, did come to the United States for an official visit, and we in protocol also handed President Tobik and his wife and took them around the United States. Uh, Liberia, that also, um, I told you about knocking on the door, I think that was quite funny with Mr. McFarland and myself escorting Mrs. Nixon to the president's door and knock on the door and he opens it up and there's 
President Tolbert. But he didn't expect you, is that it? Is that what you're <laughs> well, saying? We Why told, was he we looking were, at we your shoes? We were told to come right that certain time, protocol oh. says be there and knock on the door. Uh -huh. And he opens up the door, and but looks down. <laughs> it's ludicrous, and then shuts the door. And then Pat and I said, open the door, Richard. Open the door. <laughs> but I think and the, f I'm from sorry. From Liberia, ahead. we went on to Ghana. Ghana. And we were there for three days, and, after Miss, and we didn't do much there except for an orphanage, which was, she, she liked to go to the orphanage. There was an inauguration, right? What was happening in Ghana? No. What happened in Ghana, there was a coup right after we left. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Completely we unrelated we to the visit, of course. The president. <laughs> oh. but, in Ga but, uh, but in Ghana, uh, among the or uh, stops she made was to an orphanage. And, and Jack, you were with her when she I, arrived at the uh, orphanage. This is typical of her, wanting to do that, go to an orphanage. And I would go in ahead of her. And, and uh, this particular day, I was standing with the press. And uh, Mrs. Nixon came into the orphanage grounds. And I heard the noted philosopher and sometime UPI writer, Helen Thomas, <laughs> <laughs> standing next to me. And uh, Mrs. Nixon walked in and smiled and put her arms out. And the kids just ran to her. And Helen Thomas says, chewing her gum, says, they always can tell. I said, what are you talking about? She says, kids can always tell. I said, can always tell what? She says, they can always tell if someone's genuine or if they're a phony. You see that? They can tell. And it, it was very telling. You know, the kids just saw her and hugged her. They had, uh, Jack, do you recall when she, we also went to, to uh, uh, Indonesia and Mrs. Suharto took her to an orphanage and it was total chaos because the press came in and the baby started to cry and it was terrible. And when we finished the event, Mrs. Nixon said, from now on, we'll do orphanages, but no press. Yeah. Yeah. Right. She didn't want the children to be upset. Right. Yeah. 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 To frighten them. Yeah. Now, another thing in Ghana, there had, the Nixons had been there, of course, in 1957 for their independence ceremony. And uh, there had been a chieftain there who had, uh, who had met the, the vice president, Mrs. Nixon, briefly. I don't remember his name. Bill Chief Mary Lou is the one who remembers yeah. everything. The sub-chief. And he wrote to President Nixon when, he was, when President Nixon became president, when he was elected. And President Nixon sent a pro forma letter back saying, thank you very much. Well, this guy waved this all over. Ghana saying, he's my buddy, this President Nixon, <laughs> my real pal. So when we got to uh, the capital of Ghana and Accra, they said, of course, you must go up to the hills and meet the chief, uh, President Nixon's buddy. So who the hell is this guy? <laughs> <laughs> but we did. You know, we thought it was a courtesy. Well, he had, he had planned for a huge ceremony honoring Mrs. Nixon. And, the guy, and he was blind by then. And the first negotiation, Bill is working things out with the guy. He said, and we're going to have a mammoth ceremony. All of the sub-chieftains will be here, everyone in their native uh, garb. And uh, of course, we'll roast a goat. And, um, <laughs> yeah. and we will give the guest of honor, the, the honored guest will get the, the eyes of the goat to eat. And we're, <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> so Bill very smoothly finds a negotiator. State Department guys can do this. I can't. So, uh, instead of her eating the eyes of the goat, can't she like dance or something, you know, to show her appreciation? So we wound up dancing also with the native costumes in Ghana. But the ceremony was incredible. I mean, you just see it like you see in the old movies, and everyone are carrying in, carrying in the sub chieftains, and all of a sudden, one sub chieftain is being carried in. He's about 300 pound white redhead. You <laughs> see <laughs> her eyes get big, and evidently he had inherited the land, and he, he wouldn't give it up. So he was a sub chieftain. His father was a farmer in the pre in the Kruma days. So. Uh, on that visit to, to Ghana in 57 when they met, I think it was Chief Dan, I think that was his name, uh, that is the first time that they, my father met Martin Luther King oh, Jr. because really. he was at the inauguration. Yes. Right. He was, yeah. uh, he was there. The Independence Day, independence from Britain. And that was when their rela my father's relationship with King began. So that was a, a very historic trip. And then from there we went on to the Ivory Coast. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, President Hufwet Bonye and his wife greeted her, her Mrs. Sadat and Mrs. Nixon uh, with thousands of people, an eight mile motorcade all the way. It was un unbelievable. And that was the same time in 1972. Mm -hmm. There was not much, but it was just uh, a, a stopover, so to speak. Yeah. And then just a month later, um, the Nixons went to China uh, on that historic visit. Uh, 
several weeks ago, the Nixon Foundation and the U.S. Institute for Peace had a, a day-long symposium marking the 40th anniversary of that trip. And Secretary Hillary Clinton was the um, final speaker, the, the keynote speaker at the end of the day. And uh, she made a point of saying right at the beginning of her remarks that while this event was celebrating and marking the 40th anniversary of President Nixon's trip to China, it was also the 40th anniversary of Mrs. Nixon's trip to China. And uh, you know, most of the, the diplomats and the foreign policy analysts and, and the academics all think that the most important thing to come out of that visit was the Shanghai communique. But I think if you ask most Americans what they remember most from that, China, from that trip to China, it's two words, giant pandas. <laughs> and uh, those giant pandas right. that came to the National Zoo in 1972 came here because of, of Pat Nixon. So Julie, could you tell us a little bit about how that all played out? How did your mother score two giant pandas from the Chinese? <laughs> Well, it was at one of the um, banquets, and my mother um, was seated next to Joe and Lai, and I actually brought this artifact to show you. Uh, the Chinese, it was 72, and they were heavy smokers, and in front of each person's place was a cylinder of panda cigarettes. And so my mother and Joe and Lai are making polite conversation, and they're talking, and in fact, she thought he was very impressive, very intellectual. She enjoyed meeting him and talking with him. But at one point, she put her hand out and she pointed to the cigarettes and she said, oh, they're just so adorable, I love them. And um, he said, well, I'll give you some. And my mother said, cigarettes? And no, he said, pandas. And that's how, uh, that was the beginning of this whole negotiation to uh, uh, give the American people two giant pandas who came to live at the um, zoo in Washington. Mm -hmm. And in return, the United States gave the Chinese two musk oxen, which are very dull animals, named Milton and Matilda. <laughs> but uh, not very exciting. But the pandas, in fact, I hope a lot of you can come during the centennial year to Yorba Linda, because my favorite thing from the exhibit out there is the cage that one of the pandas was sent to the United States in, and there were two cages, and, one, and it's about the, maybe about the size of this table, maybe yeah. a little longer. Very primitive. I mean, it looks like a dog or cat cage, and apparently now panda cages are a million dollars each. Mm. So you, it's, a, it's an incredible art, artifact. And because the gift was to the National Zoo, which is part of the Smithsonian, the Smithsonian kept the crates. And that's why we were able to exhibit it at the, at the library. And I, I was amazed that uh, the pandas arrived in the United States less than two months after Joe and Lai uh, promised to give them to us. I'm, talk about cutting through red tape. Uh, it was fabulous. And your mother, we have the video. I noticed Dr. Ripley is wearing a panda tie. And I have my panda pin, I'll have you know. And I think pandemonium is going to break out right here at the zoo. <laughs> Thank you very much. She went to the zoo to uh, officially open the panda house. Yeah. And uh, she said at the end of her, her brief remarks, she said, uh, I predict that pandemonium is going to break out here at the <laughs> National Zoo. Yeah. And uh, in the years since, more than a million people every year go to see the pandas at the National Zoo. And there are several nobody, other zoos nobody in Nobody visits United the, the musk oxen in, <laughs> in, <laughs> in Peking. Yeah. It's true. It's true. No, no. because it, it, Yeah, go figure, huh? <laughs> <laughs> right. um, Jack, you were in China with the, with the President, Mrs. Nixon. And yeah. Mrs. Nixon carried out her own schedule during that time. And you took her around. And uh, what all were you doing while the president was in those talks with the Chinese leaders? He was in meetings. And uh, Mrs. Nixon would see various things, mostly, once again, trying to mingle with people. This was difficult. Those of you who have dealt in the communist world know that they're very afraid of authority figures. And Mrs. Nixon, of course, was one. And they would never just come and say hello. And they were always very tentative. And she found always a way to break the ice, mm -hmm. sometime using me as a prop. <laughs> uh, <coughs> I recall once we gonna, uh, they had only, for shopping, they had a friendship store. And that's where you could spend non-Chinese currency, American currency. Usually Euro Eastern Europeans would go there. And we went to the, and, and what do you do in, in shopping? You know, how do you, and she figured out a way. She says, OK, Brennan, you're about the same size as Ricardo. Ricardo's the president. And, uh, <laughs> <coughs> So 
I want to buy him pajamas, try on these pajamas, having absolutely no respect for the dignity of the United States Marine Corps. <laughs> <Good story. laughs> I'd take it off. Yep. I had to take off my boss and put these pajamas on, and she laughed and roared, and so everyone else did. All the Chinese thought, this is really cool, you know? <laughs> You're used to this guy. But we, now we looked for that picture, Jack, but we couldn't find yeah, it. Yeah. It's hidden in my I Love Me room. And, uh, <laughs> but yeah, you can't find it. Anyway, uh, I have it. Uh, and and every way, we went, you just saw the picture of it, went to the zoo, it's, uh, and pandas. And one little side story, always this lady, uh, Barbara Walters, we had all of the top press people, they Walter Cronkite, and, Mrs., and the president was in meetings, so they didn't want to sit outside, so they would go around with Mrs. Nixon. And of course, that's what was being projected back to the United States, so these heroes uh, in the media wanted to be next to Mrs. Nixon. And Barbara Walters was especially egregious, always trying to stand next to Mrs. Nixon. And Mrs. Nixon would smile at her and I'd grab her arm. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, Mrs. Nixon would politely chastise me later. <laughs> right? And once I, I just got... I don't think we should let you loose in the press office. <laughs> <laughs> You're too I, I, and I, once near the end, I just took Barbara Walters by the arm, took her side, said, this is not the Barbara Walters show. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <clears throat> But so we that's did. why you weren't on 10 Most Interesting People with Barbara <laughs> Walters that year. <laughs> what, what else did you see when you were over there? Uh, well, of course, we, farm, uh, of course right? with, the president, with the president, we took him along on a couple of the trips later. <laughs> we went to the, the, great, uh, the Great Wall and the Ming Tombs and, uh, you know, the dinner. So listen to this. Well, she was nice about this. We were so tired. I was so tired. Mrs. Nixon wasn't, usually. And one night we had on a schedule, Thursday night, free night, couldn't wait, all of us couldn't wait to sleep that night instead of, you know, doing something, going here and there. And uh, we left the Great Hall of the People. I get in the limo with the President, Joe and Lai, and the interpreter, and myself, and of course Secret Service, and President Nixon, just for something to say, he said, oh, uh, Mr. Premier, Mrs. Nixon and I really love Chinese food. Oh, Whenever gosh. we can, we go out for Peking duck dinner. <laughs> I thought nothing of it. Get back to our room, I tear off my uniform, can't wait to crash, knock on the door. Calligraphy, you're invited to the Great Hall of the People for a Peking duck dinner tonight. <laughs> <laughs> like, and this is, you know, I wanted to kill him and Mrs. Dixon. <laughs> but, um, Did you go, everyone go? Everyone went, everyone <laughs> went. We, and we had the four treasures soup, which is the gizzards, the heart, the intestine, and the lungs, and the hot water. And, it, <coughs> um, and you, went to, uh, you went to a commune as well when you were in China, right? What was that like? Explain uh, a little bit about what a commune, it's not like a, a 60s commune here, of, uh, you know. Uh, <laughs> over in China, it's, it's really a, a, a city. That's, a, it's, that's right, it's a city and they just all share everything in a true mo communist mode. And I think they had one television in the commune that they all shared. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, living conditions, right? just living in dirt was... Uh, it was, it was nothing you'd ever want to do. Mm -hmm. the, the incredible change, I went in 72, 76, and 79, and the changes were remarkable. Uh, uh, in, in 1972, the very, very few automobiles, except the Soviet-made ones that only carried executive or top people in the government. Everyone else was on a bicycle and in the same gray Mao suits. Once in a while, you see a blue Mao suit, and you say, who is that guy? Boy, we, you know, we, Barbara Walters should interview him. He's got to be <laughs> <laughs> But by, in 1976, you see, you know, more interesting things than some color, people wearing things, and, uh, and again in 79, this intrigued me, it intrigued Mrs. Nixon a lot more, because then people were even were more open and uh, available to, uh, uh, for conversation and to chat. So 1972, just party line, Chairman Mao says, and everyone had a minder, and you had to listen to them, repeat what Chairman Mao w wanted you to hear. We, but Mrs. Nixon always knew, a, a, a story happened, this is the 70. Six trip, um, 79 trip, excuse me. Chairman Mao's wife was Madame Cheng Cheng, one of the gang of six, and Minister of Culture, a minister, uh, what do you call a lady minister? Mm -hmm. Minister of Culture, and she had ar arranged things for us to see. And one night we were to see uh, concerts, uh, musicals, and uh, we're all ready to go. The foreign minister knocked on my door, which is the adjacent room to President Mrs. Nixon, and said, I need to talk to you alone. Talk, and he said, the fifth song, is going to be anti-Taiwanese song. <laughs> and when it ends, and of course we don't understand that's all in Chinese, when it ends, Madam Chang is gonna stand up and everyone will stand up and give a standing ovation because of the denunciation of Taiwan. 
said, you must, you should know this. I said, oh, oh, I didn't say OMG because that wasn't around then. But <laughs> I, so I, I felt, so I, I, I sat, be, I told President and Mrs. Nixon, they were kind of dubious, what's this guy? And I sat behind them and I counted the fifth song and I looked at the foreign minister and I said, okay, don't get up, just stay down now, I'm whispering to them. So sure enough, the song ended and Madam Chang jumped up applauding, it was it. <laughs> at the end of it, Mrs. Nixon just grabbed my hand and squeezed it like we did at Kid, you know? <laughs> we got to miss that. Right. So. And similarly, when we visited, uh, when we visited Chairman Mao in 1976, uh, foreign minister came to my room and said, uh, Chairman Mao would like to meet with President Nixon. I said, great, just give me a minute. I'll get them because it was late in the evening. And he said, and he wants to meet with Mrs. Nixon and with you. I said, me? He said, well, when President Nixon came previously, there were 80 some people, and now there's just one. And we respect loyalty, and he wants to thank you for your loyalty. So I told, had to tell the president this. He was not thrilled, because he, he's, you know, he's the man. He's got to do, he's all right. You and Mrs. Nixon just come in and meet him, and then leave. So. <laughs> that sounds familiar. So, so we did, so we knew our orders, and so we left. And, and then once again, just she and I rode back, and, and I, and she grabbed my hand again and squeezed it like, you know, we, 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 we did it this time. Right. And I came back, and, I, and Bill Sapphire, whose assistant is here in the audience, used to always admonish me to write everything down, write everything down. I said, what for? I'm not going to write a book, you know. And, but that night I did. Everything Mrs. I, and I still have it verbatim, everything we saw in the um, Forbidden City, what Ma's room looked like, what he looked like, the guttural language he used. Um, and I have that picture. <laughs> <laughs> you guys don't. Anyway, that's uh, incredible, incredible the things she did. Uh, and, in, and it's amazing how she could break through, even, even with people who were so unattuned to <coughs> personal relationships and for touching and talking and hugging. You see the Chinese could do that. And there was a similar sort of uh, meeting with another uh, uh, very powerful man when Leonid Brezhnev, who was General Secretary of the Soviet Union, oh boy. Uh, came to the United States in 1973, yeah. and they went out to San Clemente and right. stayed at the Nixons and at their home in You don't uh, want to hear Clemente. everything about that. Tell us about how, how the, the General Secretary wanted to meet with Mrs. Nixon and give her a gift. Some, for some reason, you know, everything in the Soviet Union, KGB in those days, ran everything. And for some reason, they thought that my military rank and military uniform was phony, just like they all, the uh, KGB had military ranks, Colonel so-and-so and, -so and General Andropov, et cetera, and they thought Major Brennan. So Andropov, who later became head of the Soviet Union, uh, uh, confronted me once in Kiev, and he said, uh, Brennan, we know you are not the major. I said, how do you mean? I'm, not a, I'm a major. He said, no, you are the strong man. I said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> they thought I was CIA. They thought I was a money thing. So. Can I interject? Yeah, Bill. Um, in, uh, Russia. We went to Russia, went on the advance, and the one place, we, several places, we, we knew that we were going to the Bolshoi Ballet and also the school of uh, those children who did the ballet. And the thing is, with regard to GUM department store, yeah. when we advanced it, there were a lot of people all outside in the shop. And then at this time, we, Mrs. Nixon arrived, the place was deserted outside. And I, and I go, what's happening here? Maybe it's the wrong day. We walked in, just the people who worked there, all in white coats, and she said to me, don't worry, they always do that. It was, ter it was yeah. very embarrassing, but you know, she, she went in there and purchased a few things, yeah. but it was yeah. embarrassing to me because we wanted a big, big yeah. crowd. Mm. Well, Don, you were with them um, in, on the, the kitchen debate in 59. Were, were you oh, not yeah. in the Soviet Union yeah. then? And that's why she said to you, Bill, well, they always do these things because she'd been there in 59 and yeah. she knew exactly, you know, how programmed um, every yeah. visit would be in the Soviet Union. But uh, that was when she didn't really have a set program, right. but she managed to uh, break the ice with the Soviet wives. Remember, uh, they never had their wives at anything and then she, she uh, broke the ice and, and had them come. Yeah, she did very well on, on that, and uh, and she also uh, challenged uh, uh, Khrushchev when they were talking about hard uh, the the solid fuel for uh, missiles, mm -hmm. and uh, the boss asked a question which uh, Khrushchev wasn't going to answer, and your mother said, 
Well, you ought to be able to answer it if you're the, you're the top man in this place and every, you know everything. And that was, yeah. It was great. In Russia, we also um, went to uh, ballet uh, school. Also, we, um, a circus, we took it to a circus, which is quite interesting, except I was a little concerned when they took us down below um, where there was a bear was right there, and I was <laughs> quite scary, but they had it around the, <clears throat> the neck. And <clears throat> excuse me. And then <clears throat> from there we went to, um, I, um, I have, we went to, after uh, so Russia, we went, <clears throat> excuse me, 74, we went to Austria, and then from there we went to Cairo, from there we went to Jeddah, Saudi, Saudi Arabia, <clears throat> to Damascus in Syria, uh, to Tel Aviv, Amman, Jordan, uh, Moscow, and the Ukraine, and Orianda in all those 1974. Can, wow. can I, just one thing, when you said Saudi Arabia, you've mentioned Saudi Arabia twice tonight. It's my, one of my favorite stories about my mother. The Saudis, the palace that, that my mother and father stayed in was so cold, and there was no way to adjust the temperature. My mother told me later she slept in the bathtub it was, yeah. the, it was the only, you know, it was sort of a little concave space. She, she moved into the bathtub. She had everything, pillows on top of her. She said it was 50 degrees. They had air conditioned it to 50 I degrees. I said, why did you want to sleep? Why did you sleep in the bathroom? Why didn't you open the window? She said, I was concerned if you opened the window, there would be an alarm. So you actually got the, the, the bath mats and what have you and wrapped yourself and slept, slept in the bathtub. I always remember that. Yeah. So. To get back to what you said, Brezhnev wanted to show his great respect for Mrs. Nixon. Oh. And while in San Clemente, he, thinking I'm King Kong, <coughs> said, told his aide, he said he, uh, he wants to see Mrs. Nixon alone. And he said, I don't know how to do this. He says, obviously, you tell Brennan. He's, you know, <laughs> <laughs> he's the KGB. Anyway, so I arranged, I said, certainly, so I brought him, I told Mrs. Nixon, I brought him over to the residence, and he went in the room with Mrs. <coughs> Nixon, and I was there, and he said, I, first he prefaced, he said, I want you to know my wife did not buy these gifts for you. I personally went and bought these because I have such great admiration for you. And he had these uh, hankies, these uh, <laughs> embroidered handkerchiefs nice. that, he, that he said, insisted yeah. he personally, and gave her a long speech because you know, she is so respected and she did so much that he wanted to personally give, buy these and personally hand them to him. <coughs> not his wife, <coughs> my wife didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> I want to take, uh, we've, we're, we're getting running uh, short on time, which is, this is going really fast for me, and I hope for you all as well. Um, and give everybody just, uh, ask to sum up a little, a little bit, and I'd like to start with Don, and um, you, you were with her during those vice presidential years when a lot of challenges got handled, the, uh, the, the travel methods, the uh, different food, the no air conditioning and everything else. How would you summarize Mrs. Nixon's ability to handle any challenge that uh, was put in front of her when she was overseas. You mind a little plagiarism? I don't, no. Okay. Give me a break here for a second. Because <laughs> I f figured you're going to ask something like that. <laughs> and uh, it's kind of hard to, uh, to really uh, express it. So I'm going to plagiarize this and I'm going to read something. He said, uh, in later years, she did not lose her touch. She was at home visiting leper colonies or riding in an open door helicopter to visit combat troops in Vietnam. And her courage were her trademark and she stood by her husband in good times and bad. And that sums up the way I feel about yeah. it. I, I use that at her eulogy at her funeral. And, uh, that's where I thought that was. Well, I you just want to assure you, when you're quoting yourself, that's not plagiarism. <laughs> <laughs> and that was, and it was yeah, such a beautiful. I knew wouldn't understand such that. A beautiful, <laughs> and I'm, I'm also very pleased that you read my memo about today all the way through to the end, that you had that prepared. That's, that's really beautiful. great. <laughs> and Don, that was a beautiful eulogy. There were four eulogists for my mother, and my father asked you to, to give one of them, and it was absolutely magnificent, as you are. Great day. Uh, Bill, I want to ask you, uh, as the State <coughs> Department uh, fellow in the striped pants, I guess that's what they used to call him, right? Um, how would you summarize Mrs. Nixon's impact on U.S. diplomacy as a result of her visits around the world as Ambassador of Goodwill? 
It was, she was wonderful because every place that we've gone to, there were thousands and thousands of people coming out. That's evidence alone to see, they want to see the First Lady. And I've been involved with uh, State Department when these other uh, prime ministers and presidents and shahs came into the United States with their First Lady. And no one can compare, can compare to Mrs. Nixon. She was absolutely magnificent and easy to work with. Uh -huh. The only thing she said to me, why do you have to have such a large entourage? <laughs> large. <laughs> I had 10 people plus Mary Lou to advance it, but of course others came in later. But we never, she never demanded anything from us, except when we went to orphanages, she said, no press no coming press. in. I yeah. always remember that. Yeah. She was really wonderful. Thank you, Bill. Jack, how would you summarize um, <laughs> particularly the trips that you were on? My gosh, one stop after another and, and difficult long schedules going long into the night. Mm. How would you summarize her work ethic on these trips? Well, I, I want to go a little bit different direction because I, I, I really am impressed with uh, all of you, well, most of you know that Mrs. Nixon is laid to rest at, <coughs> at the uh, grounds of the Nixon Library in St. Clemente. And the uh, inscription on her gravesite is, uh, I'll paraphrase it, uh, even if people do not understand your language, they know when they have love in, the, in your heart. They can tell when you have love in your heart. That epitomizes Mrs. Mm. Nixon to me. Um, and as far as her work, at, work ethic, which is incredible, she, she kept me going. I mean, I, and I was th in my 30s. <laughs> and uh, just, just never stopped, always did the right thing, never was late, never was, was as Bill says, it, the, the only complaint she ever had was, oh, we don't need that. We don't need that. That costs too much money. But, you know, don't do it. So just an amazing, amazing lady in my life, like a daughter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and Julie, how would you um, summarize basically the importance of your mother's work as ambassador of goodwill? Uh, I would just sum it up by saying that, uh, you know, sometimes people say, well, did your mother really like political life and was she unhappy in politics and all? And, and the answer always is, is that she just so believed in my father and in what he was doing. And she also believed in herself and in what she was doing. And she knew in the, in the, during the 50s when Eisenhower sent them on these incredible journeys that she was making a difference and it really was helping U.S. policy. And when my father was elected in 69, we had half a million young men, no, 550,000 young men fighting in Vietnam. I mean, this was a disaster for our country. And the war dominated all of the Nixon years. And so she was totally re-energized to do more of the diplomacy because she knew it could make a difference. And my father used to talk about, um, I'm trying to build a generation of peace for the American people. And that's what they did. I think these trips were incredibly important and we did have a generation of peace, and it was the foundations that were laid in the 50s and what they did in the late 60s and 70s, thanks to an incredible team who believed in them, supported them, advised. I thank all of you. You're, there's so many here today from the vice presidential years all the way to the end, and um, you're all part of the story. It's a great American story, and I'm just so sure. proud of what was accomplished in those years. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. I want to uh, thank everyone for coming tonight. Thank our extraordinary panel uh, who ha have not only, they've lived history and uh, they're very generous to come uh, tonight and share with us some of their stories and their memories of uh, some very momentous times in the life of our country and uh, very consequential times in the life of our country and to help everybody learn a little bit more about just what an extraordinary woman Pat Nixon was. When I was working on the Centennial exhibit in Yorba Linda, which I hope everybody will book the next flight out to California and see. Uh, we worked with a great team of designers, and uh, part of what they did is the design process is they read Julie's book and other books about Mrs. Nixon, and each one of them came to me at a different point in the process and, and said, you know, especially the first guy who was old enough to remember the Nixon years, he said, I, I, I shouldn't say this, but I've got a crush on Pat Nixon. <laughs> <laughs> And I think uh, the more everybody learns about Pat Nixon, uh, the more we all have a, a crush on her. She was an amazing woman as a uh, representative of our country around the world, uh, amazing woman as a first lady, did so much um, and was just such a great, uh, a great role model, I think, for, uh, for all of us. 
I'm, I'm sorry about the videos. I hope that uh, we will have them online at the nixonfoundation.org. Uh, the opening one has uh, Congressman Leonard Lance giving a beautiful tribute to Mrs. Floor. Nixon on the floor of the House and the well of the House. And statements from First Ladies, um, Rosalind Carter, Barbara Bush, and Laura Bush. So I hope you'll go on to the website, nixonfoundation.org, uh, to see that video. And I'm sorry we weren't able to show it uh, and to you Barbara today. Barbara Bush begins her comments, I loved Pat Nixon. That's right. <laughs> That's right. So thank you all for coming tonight.